Well, we're thrilled today to have Dr. David Wood here to do the dramatized crucifixion. And we had this years ago on the Tennessee side of, uh, when we had the church over there. And we're excited about this today. And uh, I'm so glad you're here. And God has been good to us. And I know this will be a blessing today. So I want you to pray for him. And then listen, this is a, this is a time that God has had for you to be here. It's not an accident. You're here on purpose today. And uh, it's our prayer that uh, everyone today uh, that's here, if, you're, if you've never known the, come to know the Lord, if you don't know the free pardon of sin today and this wonderful salvation, oh, it's our prayer. And all the work and the labor has gone into this because we care. But I'll tell you, more than we care, Jesus cared. And he cared so much. And you'll notice in the little, uh, uh, in the little production that the young people just did, that Jesus still had the wounds in his hands. What about that? Uh, you know, the only glorified body in heaven with any defects or any scars or wounds will only be Jesus. Everybody else will there be perfect, but we'll never forget what he did for us on the cross. So you pray for Brother Woods he comes today, all right? Thank you, Pastor. What a joy it is to be here this morning. I don't know about you, but my heart was touched by those young people. How many teenagers are in the building? Would you stand up, please? All the teenagers. Not you wish you were. You really are one. All right. Look at that. Let's give them a hand. I love teenagers, man. Let's give them a hand. They did a great job on that presentation. Thank you. You can be seated. Preacher, thanks for inviting me. I was, had the privilege to be here yesterday, and we had a lot of folks talking about this issue of witnessing effectively and these sort of things, and I have been praying much and anticipating being here in this service this morning. Now, I need to ask one other question before I start, if I can. How many of you, like I am, you're not a member of this church? I mean, maybe you've been here before, but as of this morning, you're a visitor, you're not a member. Would you hold your hand up good and high for just a minute? Wow. Well, praise the Lord. I always tell those that are visiting, if you do what you can to make me feel at home, I'll do what I can to make you feel at home. Amen? And so, we're delighted that you're here, delighted that God's going to touch our heart. If you have your Bible, hold it up good and high. How many folks have a Bible? If you have an electronic Bible, you can hold it up also, all right? If you can't, you got to join them, amen? Now, open your Bibles with me, please, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23 and verse 33. Luke, chapter 23 and verse 33. What you're going to see this morning, in the next few moments, what you're going to hear, what you'll experience did not have to happen. I very simply mean Jesus did not have to come. He did not have to suffer. He did not have to die. The obvious question, if he didn't have to do it, then why did he come? The answer to that question is because of the great love that he has for each one of us that are here today. I want you to stand with me for just a moment, if you would, if we read this verse and look at it very carefully in the Word of God. Luke chapter 23 and verse 33. The Bible said, And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Look at the first half of that verse once again with me, if you would. The Bible said, And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified Jesus. Before we bow our heads and our hearts together in prayer, I'd like to invite you to look this way, if you would, for just a moment. For I believe with, with all of my heart, there is not one person in this room today by accident. That is not a boy or girl, that is not a man, that is not a young person. Nobody's here by accident. But every one of us are here this morning by divine appointment. And God has brought us here that he might speak to our heart. I'm going to ask you to do something a little different. In a moment when we bow our head, I'm going to ask you to take a second and say, Dear Lord, please today touch my heart. Let's bow our heads and our hearts together in prayer. May we every head is bowed and every eye is closed. And God speak into our heart. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and the Lord speak into our heart, would you take just a moment right now to very simply say, God, today speak to my heart. Lord, I need your touch. God, do something in my life. Maybe there's somebody here today with a heavy heart looking for an answer. Maybe somebody has a sin problem. It looks like, wow, this will never, never have an end. Maybe somehow today you need a special touch from God. Would you take a moment right now just to simply say, Lord, today I need you. Simple prayer, God, I need you. Now, dear Lord, I ask you now that the Holy Spirit 
God will prepare the heart of every man, every lady in this auditorium. May you cause our holy hearts to fall upon our hearts, that today that God you touch us, that God would never be the same. For that man, for that lady that's here that's never been saved, that today would be the hour of salvation. God, please don't let a person leave this auditorium today and die and go to a real hell. And then, Lord, I ask you today for believers, God, draw us closer to you and give us a greater love for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Be seated if you would, please. I feel certain that most of you would agree with me when I stand and say that the great love verse of the Bible is really John chapter 3 and verse 16. Listen to it as I read it. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. But you know, with that verse, like most of the scripture, we read it and we quit reading too soon. Listen to the next verse, John 3 and verse 17. The Bible says that God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. Now, my dear friend, there are a lot of us today that in America, we think that God sent Jesus to condemn us. Or God sent Jesus, his son, to leave us guilty. Jesus didn't come to condemn you. Jesus didn't come to leave you guilty. Then you say, what is it that leaves me guilty? What is it that condemns me? According to the Bible, it is our sin that condemns us. It's our sin that leaves us guilty. Then why did God send his son? Listen to the last half of this verse. The Bible says that God sent his son so that we might be saved. The reason that Jesus came is so that each one of us could walk out of this building today and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that when we die that heaven's our home. That's the reason that Jesus came. What I'm going to invite you to do with me this morning is this. I'm going to ask each one of you for the next few minutes to take a trip with me, a journey back in time. We're going to walk back to 2,000 years ago. The land that we're going to enter together is the land of Israel. The setting is the very season that Jesus was crucified, much like our calendar date today. You remember what the Bible said, they had made advanced preparation to try to get him crucified. Much had gone on behind the scenes. The Lord Jesus, you remember, walked into that garden across that small brook of Kedron after he had met with those disciples in another upper room. While he was in the upper room with those 12 disciples, you remember, he was celebrating several things, one being the feast of the Passover. Of course, celebrating what Jesus had done in type in the Old Testament as he put our sin upon the Savior. Jesus looked around that room with those men, and he said, men, one of you will betray me. One of you will betray me. And men, they began to look at him, I think, much like we were, and said, Lord, is it me? Am I going to be the one? Will I betray you? Remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, the one to whom I give this sop and I dip it, he'll be the betrayer. And he dipped the sop and gave it to Judas. And looking deep in his heart, his eyes, he said, Judas, whatsoever Satan has put in your heart to do, go and do. You remember that Judas got up and left that upper room and started on the path that led to the betrayal. We don't really know from the Bible exactly how long he stayed in that upper room. But eventually he motioned for those disciples to follow him. And they left the upper room and walked down through the tiny streets of Jerusalem and exited the gate through that eastern gate in the city wall of Jerusalem. If you'll allow me to stop the narrative of the story of the crucifixion long enough, I think it behooves us this morning to understand a little bit more who was this man called Jesus. My dear friend, Jesus Christ is the virgin-born incarnate Son of God. He's the second person of the Trinity. Jesus was 100% God when he was born. He was born through a virgin, but he had a divine father. And Jesus came and was born sinless. He lived sinless. And when he died on that cross, the blood that he shed was a complete sacrifice for the penalty of our sin. When he died, they took him off that cross and they buried him in a bar or two. But thank God the grave could not hold him. And three days and three nights later, up from the grave he arose. And Jesus is not dead this morning. Jesus is alive. And one day he's coming back for us. And you know what? Soon he's going to come back and establish his rule upon this earth. And we're going to forever be with him. What a glorious thing to understand who Jesus is. You see, when he comes back, he's going to enter the city of Jerusalem through that same eastern gate that he exited the very night before he was crucified. He led those men across that small brook of Kedron, walking to the Garden of Gethsemane, left eight up on the edge of the garden. No particular commandment. He took three of them, Peter, James, and John, to the heart of the garden. He left them there. He said, man, I want you to watch and pray. You remember Jesus went to the heart of the garden and fell on his face in prayer. After an hour, he came back to Peter, James, and John, and they were sound asleep. Jesus began to shake them and awaken them. And he said, 
Could you at least just watch and pray with me for just one hour? I think in that we find one of the great reasons we have such a need in our churches in America, such a need of revival. We ought to be watching and praying. We ought to be occupying until he comes. But my dear friend, most of us, even the no Christ, we're sound asleep in our so-called prosperity and our pleasure. Don't you think they should have been a little bit embarrassed when Jesus had to reach over and awaken them and just say, couldn't you watch and with me for just one hour? He left and went back to the heart of the garden, fell on his face and prayed a second time. He came back and they were sound asleep again. He left them as they were and went back a third time, this time leaving them asleep. And he fell on his face and prayed. And he prayed that prayer that most of us remember. We learned it in Sunday school. Do you remember it? He said, Father, he said, for me, possibly, he said, take this cup from me. Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. We read that prayer so quickly we misunderstand it. We think Jesus is saying, God, I don't want to go to the cross. The Lord, find another way. That's not at all what he was saying. As he looked deep within that cup, what he saw was our sin. All of our sin. Our liquor, our drugs, our immorality. That sin that we think nobody else really knows anything about. Now help me with this. What does the Bible say about sin? The wages of sin is, is death. Now if the penalty of my sin and your sin had fallen on Jesus in the garden, he would have died under the penalty of sin. He wasn't praying to find another way to go to the cross. What he was asking God to do is for the penalty of my sin and your sin not to fall on him in the garden so he could be delivered to go to the cross and die for each one of us. He was surrendering himself afresh to go to the cross. While he was praying, there was a group that came in the garden on the other side. The Sanhedrin came in, part of the representative of the Jewish leaders. The Roman soldiers that had come to arrest him, and they were led by a man named Judas the betrayer. You see, they had wanted to crucify Jesus for three years, but they needed somebody to betray him, somebody to point him out. And Judas said, I'll do it. And he gave them a sign. He led them into the heart of that garden. He walked over, and he literally embraced Jesus and said, planted a kiss of a trail on the side of his cheek and said, this is the man. One of you might stand in this section of the auditorium and say, how could Judas betray him? Why would you do that? Well, he was a, a disciple for three years. One of you might stand and say, I've got the answer. He betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver, and so he did. But before you set in judgment on Judas, listen, most of us in this auditorium, most people in America, we have betrayed Jesus for much less than 30 pieces of silver. Why, we betray him for one night stand. We betray him for that secret sin that we think nobody knows about. The Bible says every time we sin against a holy God, we betray the innocent blood of the only begotten Son of God. They arrested Jesus. You remember they had several steps they had to go through. The Roman government allowed the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders, to bring accusation and even to render whether he was guilty of innocent, but they could not carry out the sentence. And the Sanhedrin wanted him crucified, so they had to take him to the governor, to the Roman leader. They had to take him to Pilate. Pilate found several things after they brought him to him and tried to release him. From my study of the Bible, it doesn't seem to me that Pilate really wanted to crucify him. You say, Pilate, you think Pilate loved him? No, I don't think Pilate loved him. That's not the issue. Pilate was a very shrewd politician. He knew there were three different camps that thought about Jesus in Jerusalem. Anything he did with Jesus, somebody would have been against him. So he tried to get the responsibility of Jesus off of his own hands. Does that sound like most of us? That's not any, most people today. He's all right, but I don't want any responsibility. Pilate did everything he could. You remember the last thing that he tried? He went out and stood on the window ledge of his window overlooking his courtyard. The Jewish nation were before him. He had his guards to bring them all in. He waited until they were quiet. He pulled out a known criminal that had, been, that had already been tried, that was ready for ex execution. Threw him out on this side, a man named Barabbas, he said, it's your Passover season. Normally, I pardon a criminal in your Passover season. I normally choose the man I'll pardon, but I'm going to let you choose. He showed him Barabbas, this front page, what would be called criminal. You want me to pardon him, put him back on the street with you? You want him to be on the street with your children? I'll give you an option. He brought Jesus out on the other side. This is Jesus. Why, he claims to be the Christ. I've examined him. I don't find anything wrong with him. Which one do you want me to pardon? Led by the Sanhedrin, they begin to cry aloud, Barabbas, Barabbas. And I believe 
Pilate could hardly believe his ears. Wait a minute, if I pardon Barabbas, then what do you want me to do with Jesus? Why, he claims to be the Christ. Led by the Sanhedrin again, they begin to channel out, crucify him, crucify him. Now Pilate did something that everybody in this room has done it one way or another in our own, our own sense. He called for a laver of water to be brought out. While the mob watched, that laver of water resembled much what you and I would call a cement or concrete bird bath. He began to wash his hands before the crowd. You know what he was trying to signify? I don't have any responsibility towards Jesus. It's all on your shoulders. You say, preacher, I've never done that. No, here's the way we do it. We say, preacher, I, I know he's Jesus. He claims to be the Christ. I don't have a thing against him, but I'll not receive him. I, I'm really not for him. Has it never dawned on you, the Bible said, that if you have not received him, you've rejected him? In fact, the Bible said, if you're not for God, that you are against him. They took Jesus there. and They began to prepare him for the crucifixion. The first thing they did while the mob waited, they sent him below the chambers of Pilate. They stripped him nude down to the waist, anchored his feet to the floor, tied his hands together, put a rope around his hands and threw it up over a pulley in the ceiling and began to pull on that rope. Remember, his feet were tied. And they began to pull that rope as tight as they could, trying to stretch his body. Then they tied the other end off. Then one of the Roman soldiers reached over and picked up what has grown to be called a crucifixion scourge, much like this whip that I have in my hand. The handle about, what, seven, eight inches long so it can be swung accurately. It was not one piece of leather, but several pieces of leather. It had been woven together so that could act as a hinge so he could swing it real accurate. But at the end of every piece of leather, there was a knot tied. And in their whip, there was a sharp object like a piece of glass or metal. Do you know the man that would swing this, this whip was so practiced before they'd let him scourge a man that he could literally take this and he could take an apple hanging on a tree and peel the apple without making the core drop to the ground. You see, the Romans made a sport out of this. They made a sport out of everything. And they had already assigned so many lashes for this man. In fact, they had two people to count. One would count for the victim to make sure he'd get an extra lash of that whip. Because sometime an extra lash of that whip could so cut the abdomen section of a man open his intestines would fall. The other man would count for the state to make sure he got every lash that had been prescribed. The man you see that was swinging the whip had a limited amount of stripes to completely scourge his body and to tear it apart. But my dear friend, when they scourged Jesus, nobody counted but God the Father. And not one man, but several of those soldiers would pick up scourges, and they would whip Jesus, and time and time again they would take it and bring it down upon his body, and walk around to others and bring it down upon his body. They had designed it in such a way they would begin below the knees, come up to the thighs, then go down the back, then across the front. The first thing they would do around the body is lightly cut it. Have you ever cut your finger with a piece of paper? You know it's cut because you see the blood, but it's light. They did that to the entire body first, first time around it. They wanted the body to go into complete trauma. They accomplished that. The second time, they would go deeper. This time, they would go into the muscle system. Most of us understand that when a muscle bleeds, the blood takes the power to the muscle, and the man is rendered ineffective or weak. The third time around, they would dig hard, down deeper, and cut the sinew loose. The sinew ties the muscle to the skeleton system. When they finished this time, the man was rendered literally without any control of his body. And time and time again, they would take the whip and walk around his body and bring it down upon him until when they had finally finished scourging Jesus. The Bible said there was nothing left about him that any longer resembled a man. Those that have studied it said, should you take an animal the same size, tie its feet down and draw it up high like this and take a sharp knife, skin it alive, then lightly fillet it. That's what Jesus looked like when they finished scourging him. I believe they reached up and cut the rope that held him up. I will be very possibly Jesus fell in a puddle of his own blood. But thank God somehow he had the strength to surrender himself and stand back up and go to the cross and pay the penalty for us. The people outside hadn't seen him yet. They pushed him up out of that chamber. They had a, something like a stand for him to put on. They pushed him up on it, 
and they humiliated him in public as they stripped him absolutely new. They brought the cross out. It had not been nailed together yet. They put one end on the shoulder, the other end on the ground. It was his lot now to take that cross to the top of Mount Calvary. Now you need to listen very, very carefully because it's a miracle that Jesus died for us, is it not? But my friend, it's a miracle physically that he even lived till he got to the top of Mount Calvary. You see, they beat him as he walked by. The Bible says some are so incited of hell, they bit him as he walked by. The prophet said one reached out and took the hair of his face, his beard, and tore it loose. They would take stones and toss at him. Again, listen, it's a miracle that he got to the top of Mount Calvary. Once he got there, here's the way they drove the nails in his body. Here's the way they attached him to that cross. They took the tall piece and they laid it flat on the ground. About seven foot up from the bottom, there was a bias, a piece for his feet, so that he'd push his ankles down. It took two soldiers to cross his ankles and hold his ankles in place like this. A third soldier reached over and picked up a crucifixion spike, much like this nail that I have in my hand. Except their spike had barbs on it. When you pushed it through the flesh, it cannot be retreated. And if you can imagine the anguish of that, with both ankles crossed, one nail on top, they took a hammer and they drove that nail. Once that nail was driven firmly in place, most of the time they would wrap a piece of leather around the ankles to keep it from tearing loose because of the pressure they were going to put on the body as they stretched it. You see, the same two soldiers released his ankles now. The nail held it in place. One caught one arm, one caught the other. He was flat on the ground. They would pull his body up as tight as they could. Once they pulled it up as tight as they could, they would notch it about where his shoulders were and they would set it up at the waist. They put the cross member down, and they nail and tie it in place, and now they push his body back down and hook his elbow over the cross member, sometimes having to take a stick to hold it in place. They would stand on the hand to put pressure on it and bring it down, and they took a second nail, and they put it in the middle of his wrist, and holding it there, they drove that nail. His left shoulder would be turned over now, as you could imagine, because of pain, trying to take the pressure off the body, but they'd lift this hand up now, and they'd hold it up, this arm in place, and they would twist his body until they got it equally taut on both sides. They'd hook this elbow and push this hand down, and standing on it, they'd take a third nail, put it in his wrist, and they drove that nail. Do you know why they nailed Jesus to the cross like that? A perfect Roman crucifixion was when every bone in the body of the victim was out of joint. The Bible says when they crucified our Savior, not one bone was broken, but every bone was out of joint. They helped to accomplish it this way. Once they nailed him to the cross... They had a hole they had dug several feet deep. They set the cross on an upright mantle. Several strong soldiers would lift it high in the air. One got on his knee to guide the bottom. On a certain signal, they released the cross. It free fell several feet, hit the bottom of that, and stopped so suddenly with jerk his body. We were told you could hear the bones pop out of location all of the city of Jerusalem. And that was our Savior, the Son of God, suspended between the heaven and the earth. This morning, ladies and gentlemen, I want to invite you to behold that man. Sometimes we make a mistake. Our mistake is this. We think that once they nailed Jesus to the cross and put the cross up, as he was dying for us, that people worshipped him. The opposite is true. They cussed him, threw rocks at him, tore at him, did what they could to mock him. You would think the first word Jesus ever said were words of anguish and bitterness to the mob, but the first words he ever spoke were words of forgiveness. Listen to those words with me. Father, 
Forgive them, for they know not what they do. After Jesus had been on the cross about an hour, the way they attached him to the cross, it cut the blood circulation down in his body. With the blood circulation cut down in his body, that means the muscles could not be fed. You'd have a muscle to go numb. You've had a muscle go numb. What do you do? You rub it. You know that muscle, if it still didn't get the correct amount of blood, it begins to draw into a knot and it cramps. If it still does not get fed correctly, it can even draw that part of the body loose to where the skeletal system is drawn apart. Jesus had no way to get the blood circulating through his body correctly. After an hour on the cross, his muscles began to go numb. They would cramp and draw. He looked down at the foot of the cross and he saw his mother Mary and the apostle John. And fulfilling his responsibility as an older son, he looked down at them and he spoke these words of tenderness. Woman, behold thy son, behold thy mother. Jesus was not the only one being crucified. You read it with me in the Bible a minute ago. There were two thieves, one on one side and one on the other. You remember one of the thieves looked at him and began to just malign him. And if you're really God, save yourself. Why, if you're really the son of God, what way for somebody that's deity to die? Why don't you save yourself and save us? The thief on the other side looked at his comrade and said, leave him alone. This man's done nothing amiss. He made an unusual request. Lord, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And my dear friend, Jesus took time to be a soul winner, even while he was dying on the cross. He turned and looked at that thief, and he spoke these words of forgiveness. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Jesus had been on the cross now for three hours. After three hours, the body, physically speaking, had been torn to the point of physical exhaustion. And actually, the torture was unbe unbelievable. But bugs would light on the body. And they would go in and out the openings of the body and feed on him while he was alive. Birds would light on the shoulder and peck at the saucers of the flesh and even the eyes. During that time, the people got in to saw, see all the agony and the brightness of that noonday hour. And they watched it, but somebody else was watching. It was God the Father. And at 12 noon, that bright time of the day, it's as if God was saying, I can take it no more. And God reached up, as it were, and took the shade of the universe, and he pulled it down over the sun. And the Bible says at that very moment that darkness covered the whole earth. One moment, the brightness of noon. The next moment was so dark you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. The crowd drew back now. There was something different about this man. What was it? They quieted themselves. One... A centurion went and fell down at the foot of the cross and declared his face. He said, my Lord and my God. But something else began to happen that most of us, even as believers, never really, we live and never really understand. In order for Jesus to forgive our sin, he had to take our sin in his own body while he was on the cross. He took our sin in his own body, but it caused the separation of his soul from the favor of the Father. And during that time of separation, he lifted his voice to the heavens and he declared these words. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Did God really forsake his son while he was on the cross? Yes, he did. You say, I don't understand that. Listen to the Old Testament prophet. He said, God is the purer eyes than the whole iniquity. God took your sin and my sin and placed it on his only son. And Jesus suffered and paid the price for our sin as he died on the cross. After four hours on the cross, his body began to go through a time of dehydration. That means all the water in the body went to the interior pleural cavities. While he was hanging, his exhaustion, the only thing that was holding up was nails through his hand. His pool cavities were filled with water. The lower he would go, the more his lungs would be immersed in that water. He couldn't breathe. He could even suffer, suffocate internally. He'd pull up to get a breath, but he couldn't hold it. He'd go back down and pull up again to get a breath. His lips would crack and bleed. His tongue had swollen to the place that he could hardly have in his spittle. It was during that time that he spoke the only two words to show that he had any physical need. Listen to them with me. I thirst. Do you know why he thirsted like that? 
so that you don't have to thirst. He said this in John chapter 10, I am come that they may have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Do you know why he died like that? So that you don't have to die. You heard me correctly. There's not one verse in the Bible that says that a believer dies. Contrary, the Bible says for those that are saints, those that have been saved, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He not only came and lived for you, he not only died on the cross and paid the penalty for your sin, but three days and three nights later, up from the grave he arose, and he overcame death, the last enemy that you've got, so you can have now the gift of eternal life. That's what he did for us. It's now that he lifted his voice and spoke the three greatest words of victory that man has ever heard. It is finished. What did he mean by those words? It is finished. Every one of us have sinned against God, have we not? It's not who's the biggest sinner. The Bible said if we sin against God at one point, we're guilty of it all. We've sinned against a holy, righteous God. When Jesus said it's finished, he made a glorious proclamation. Sin's debt has been paid. I think maybe one of the worst things about a person instantly when they die going to hell is that maybe the first thing they'll find out when they got there. They went to hell for absolutely no reason whatsoever. Jesus had already paid the entire sin debt, but they refused to receive Christ as Savior. I beg you today, regardless of your background or where you come from, I'm not talking about church. I'm not talking about membership. I'm not talking about joining something. I'm talking about an eternity in heaven or an eternity in hell. Please don't leave this building today and turn down the Son of God. Once Jesus had totally paid the sin debt of the world, he lifted his voice and he spoke the last words he would ever speak this side of the grave. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. you bow your head with me in prayer please all over the building please every head is bowed every eyes closed no one move unless it's an absolute emergency no one move and no one leave please no distraction because I'm going to invite you to spend a minute with God you see what do you mean I'm going to invite you to spend a personal minute with God right where you are as if you were the only person in this auditorium nobody here but just you and God I'm going to ask you to do it this way as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I'm going to ask you spiritually speaking to draw a circle around yourself right now. Just draw a circle around yourself. Now I invite God inside of that circle. Now here's the question. Here's the question. If something should happen and God should take your life today, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? I don't mean are you a Baptist. I don't mean are you Catholic or charismatic. I'm not talking about religious background. I'm talking about your, your future, your eternity. Here's what I really mean. Think it through for a minute. If you walked out of this building today and God should take your life today, where would you be tonight? Where would you be this Sunday night? Would you be in heaven or would you be in hell? 